we continue our return to worship series today, it will be on the topic of encouragement. Last week, if you recall, we looked at returning to worship discouragement in uh, Ezra chapter 4. We'll review that in just a minute. But again, we are in this series of messages that are entitled Returning to Worship. And I felt them appropriate because of what's going on right now in our world. These phases of reopening and returning. And it was my conviction that the most important return, the most important reopening, is that of uh, God's people to His church. And we're looking at a wonderful historic example that God has given us in the book of Ezra about returning to worship. As God's people, after a time of captivity, after a time of being out of God's house, return to the land to restore, to rebuild the temple, and to return to worship. We're in chapter 5 this morning. But I just want to review again what has gotten us up to this point. Israel has been taken captivity to the nation of Babylon because of their sin, particularly because of their sin of disobedience, not observing uh, the Sabbath year. They did this for 70 years, right? Uh, so they are in, uh, well, 490 years. They did this, uh, they are in captivity to Babylon for 70 years. Well, the nation Persia comes in and defeats the nation of Babylon. King Cyrus is the king of Persia. He realizes the people that he has, the Israelites, and he issues a decree for Israel to return from the old nation of Babylon to return back to their homeland, back to the promised land back to Jerusalem, and he issues a decree for them to rebuild the temple. There was much provided for them to help with the return, and the temp even the temple vessels were returned with them. Chapter number 2, we see some specific names mentioned. Real people returned, 50,000, which is a considerably small number that made the first return return back to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the temple and to return to worship. Offerings were given by these returnees for the temple. The first thing they rebuilt was the altar and sacrifices were restored. So before they even started on the temple foundation, they made sure to build the altar back and to start uh, offering burnt offerings to the Lord, right? Sin offerings, knowing that they were sinners, that they had sinned against God. They recognized this through their burnt offerings. After this, after their spiritual restoration, getting right with God, they begin to be on the right track as they build the foundation foundation of the temple. After the temple foundation is laid, there's a great praise service there in Jerusalem, a thundering praise service as many around heard their praises. Some even wept because they knew that the grandeur of the original temple, Solomon's temple, it would not be matched with the new temple, Zerubbabel's. Then last week we looked at there was discouragement from the enemies. Right? They hired counselors that came in among the people to discourage their work, to discourage them from rebuilding the temple. There was threats. There was constant discouragement. And we looked at last week when we are doing God's work, when we are doing God's will, when we're going in the right direction, guess what? There will be discouragement. Satan will try to hinder God's work in any way he can. And we saw this with Israel as they are trying to rebuild the temple. Now discouragement will be there when God's work is being done. We've got to understand that. And discouragement does set, have setbacks and does hinder work. But we cannot allow discouragement to stop God's work. We cannot allow discouragement to stop us from serving the Lord and to get out of His will. But that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. After discouragement and discouragement and discouragement, for 15 years, they stopped God's work. They were doing so well. They were on their way back, returning to worship. There was a great wave. The 
temple foundation had been restored, had been built. There was a great praise service. Spiritually, they were beginning to be restored. Then discouragement comes and they stop God's work. Not for a day, not for a week, but for 15 years, they got out of service to God because of discouragement. That's where we find ourselves in chapter 5. And we're going to see some forms of encouragement for the people to start back to finish the temple and to return to worship. And I hope it applies to us today. Though there will be discouragement as we discussed that we will keep on keeping on and be encouraged by three things. By God's commandments, by God's men, and by God's help. It's the three things we'll look at this morning. So when discouragement does happen, God's people need some encouragement in the midst of discouragement. But as we will see in our text, the encouragement usually comes in brutal honesty and reality. Right? Not in a pampering, leniency, ignoring the real issue way. Right? Sometimes we see encouragement as, well, it's okay that you have been out of church. Well, it's okay that you've been out of God's service. It's okay that you've put things before God. Just come back now. It's okay. We won't talk about it. There's a leniency. There's a pamper. We don't want to hurt your feelings. Please, maybe if we hurt your feelings, you won't come back, right? You won't serve God. So let's pamper. Let's do that. And maybe that will encourage you to get back in God's house. Maybe that will encourage you to get right with God. But that That's not how God handles the situation with the Israelites. God's honest. God shares truth. God tells them how it is. And by the conviction of the Holy Spirit and by their renewed dedication to God, they return to worship and they finish the temple. So encouragement can come, should come in the form of truth and honesty and reality. Okay? So that's something... I want to share with you today. The best way to encourage anybody in your life is with the truth. Okay? Today, we will see encouragement because of God's commandments, encouragement because of God's men, and encouragement because of God's help. Our text really is uh, the whole of chapter 5 and the first 14 chapters of chapter 6 I want to go to the very end of chapter 6, verse 14 of our text for my first point this morning. That will be encouragement because of God's commandments. That the first thing is we need to be encouraged because of God's commandments. Ezra 6, 14. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. But go back up. I've outlined it here on our board. It says they finished it according to what? The commandment of the God of Israel. Israel had already been encouraged and been commanded by God to rebuild the temple. That should have been enough, right? God said it, God decreed it, God issued it, and with that all said and done, no matter the discouragement, no matter the hindrances, no matter what comes up, they needed to continue the rebuilding of the temple because God had commanded it. God had not changed His mind. God had not changed His command. God still wanted them to. You see, the people had changed. The people made the decision to draw away from God. God did not change. His command did not change. And His word to rebuild the temple did not change change fully convinced and we'll see the evidence here that if God's people would have continued would have persevered wouldn't have threw their hands up and stopped returning to worship God would have providentially helped them and made sure they had the ability to rebuild the temple as he would in this chapter there was another uh, discouragement that come but it says the people of God did not stop the work this time God helped them God provided what they needed to finish rebuilding the temple. So the people should have originally been encouraged by God's command, end 
of story. We, as God's people, need to be encouraged because of God's word and the commandments in it. End of story. We don't need anything else. Amen? We don't need that, come on, let's go, let's do this. Come on. God's word and what he said and his commandments in it are enough. Amen? God said it. Do it. Psalm 119, 57 through 60. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. God has said it. God has given his commands in his word to worship him. And that is enough. There's these people that want to be dragged, that want to be pleaded, that want to be begged to come back to worship, to serve God, to do this and to do that. But it, that should not be the encouragement. The encouragement is God's revealed word and we obey it no matter what. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Do you remember how Paul started that out? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren. Now, he was pleading with them to serve. He was pleading with them to give their bodies a sacrifice, you remember? But what did he plead them by? He said, I plead them by myself. Will you please come? I'm working. I'm working so hard. Will you please come and serve God? Is that what he did? He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by what? The mercies of God. Now listen here, guys. You worship God and you serve God because of His mercy and His grace and His love. Amen? That's got to be enough. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has to be enough for you. Because there is nothing that can be added to it. If the blood of Christ won't bring you to worship, if the grace and mercy of God that He has shown a wretched, helpless sinner is not enough for you to come and worship God, nothing else will be. Amen? I mean, that's what to drive you. I to make you run to do anything that you can to serve the Lord because He pulled you out of that miry pit and He saved your soul by grace and mercy and love while you were a sinner. And from that, you cannot help but to worship God. God's the motivation. God. Not having to be encouraged by others first. Dragged to church. Dragged to serve. You don't have to drag people that love God. You don't have to. You don't have to drag people to serve God or to put them in a position or to get something done for God. They're going to do it on their own because they're not doing it for you. They're going to do it on their own because they're doing it for their love of God, their Lord, their Savior. And that's what we need in Bethel is people motivated by the love and grace and mercy of God and nothing else. Right? It's that simple. Encouraged to serve because of your love 
because of your duty to your Lord and Savior. <laughs> and it's to bring glory to God. You see that? When you start, when I start preaching because I love God, because it's my duty, and because I want to bring God glory, I'm going to preach my lungs out, and I'm going to preach until the Lord calls me home. Because I want to bring Him honor and glory. And when you do that in your life. Again, true service of God should not to be begged or pleaded to serve and return to worship. But serve and worship on their own initiative because of their relationship with the Lord. So let me ask you a question. What is your service and dedication connected to? Think about any time that you serve or you return to worship or whatever it is in your life that's connected to God. What is the motivation? What causes you to do that? Is it your pride? Is it your family? Is it because of habit? I mean, I want you to go deep down for the reason, the motivation. Is it because you want recognition or you want to be seen by those around that you are a part of the church, that you are a worshiper? Is it because you just want to feel good that you have accomplished, that you've done what you needed to? Your reputation? Maybe, maybe it's just out of guilt. Maybe it's just a filler. Well, I don't have anything else to do. But all those are wrong motivations. This morning, as you return to worship, the motivation is, is because of your love and your duty to God to bring Him honor and glory. That is a proper motivation. That's what the people of Israel needed to be motivated by. God's Word, His commandment, and that only. And that should have been enough. But it wasn't for them. And for many Christians, it's not. So, God has men. And God has messages that He preaches through these men. And that's the next thing we'll see in our text. Look at verses, uh, encouragement because of God's men. Encouragement because of God's men. Verses 1 through 2 of chapter 5. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So God provided two men, Haggai and Zechariah, to preach to the people of Israel to encourage them to return to worship and to rebuild the temple. The people were not solely responding out of dedication to God. They were not solely responding because of their love of God, because of His grace, because of His commandment. They, that wasn't enough for them at that time. So God sends some men. He sends His words through the prophets He placed among the people. They had forgotten or ignored the original command from God. So God sent prophets to reiterate His message. Not a new message, right? Now it was more revealed word, but it was the same point. Return to worship, rebuild the temple. So I think it's pertinent. that Let's turn to those two books and just read a portion of them. Really the first few verses of each book. And see the message that they preached. To encourage the people to return to worship. Go to Haggai. It's one of the minor prophets towards the end of the Bible. And Zechariah will be right behind it. In 
and then Malachi is the last book of the Bible. It's really three books from the New Testament. <clears throat> All right. Same time period. This is the message that the prophets had. And I'm telling you how applicable it is for us today. Look at Haggai. Let's start in verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king. Same time period. In the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, so Haggai's the preacher. He comes in and he gives a message to Jeshua, to Zerubbabel, to the leaders. And here's what it is. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The first thing we see in this passage is that the people said what? What did the people say? It is not the right time. That's what the people said. They, they were saying for 15 years. They said it in year one, year two, year three, 15 years. There's discouragement. There's danger, there's problems, it's difficult. Therefore, it must not be God's timing. It's not the right time for us to rebuild the temple. But it is because God commanded it already. But they're saying, it's not the right time. It's not time for me to get my life right. It's not time for me to return to worship. It's not time for us to obey God. That's what they were saying in their hearts. It's not time the Lord's house should be built. Does that sound familiar? Verse 3. <laughs> Man, this is good. Then came the word of the Lord Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, in this house, lie waste? What's he saying? Is it time for you to do everything else? You're building your life. You're building your house. You're doing your work. You're doing what you want to do. Everything else in your life, it's time for that. But it's not time to return to worship. What do you think? We see the world. Doing everything else. I, I've I had to go to meet with my uh, um, advisor, professor at the seminary for my thesis Friday. I mean, the traffic is crazy. Every, I mean, people are out everywhere. And everything. And every, I mean, it, it's, it's like nothing's happened. Then God's house has been empty. I don't understand. I do understand. People say it is not the right time to build the Lord's house. And he says, is it time to do everything else in your life? That's just the truth. But it's meant to encourage you. So verse 5 and 6, it, he says, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, what does he say? Man, consider your ways. You have sown much. You bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. And I know so many people that have turned their back on worship and God and everything else and 
their life has just gone to shambles. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, He says it again, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain. He says, Consider it. It's time to get back. So here's what you need to do. Respond. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is waste. And you run every man into his own house. You do everything else. You're running everywhere else, but you're not coming to worship God. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon the cattle, and upon the labor of the hands. Verse 12, the people finally respond to the preaching of the word and the preaching of God's message. They respond. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. God has a man. God has a message. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people. Man, I love that. God has a messenger. God has a message. Here's what he's saying. I am with you, saith the Lord. Now you've decided to return, and I'm going to be with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek. The, um, the high priest and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They responded. Go over a couple pages, maybe just one in your Bible to Zechariah. We'll read the first four verses, the other message Zechariah had. Now, the whole of Zechariah has really uh, encouraged the people who found themselves in a state of profound discouragement that had clouded Israel's outlook. It really encourages that, hey, temporarily and in the future, God is going to come through. God's going to provide. It's really hope for the future of Israel in Zechariah. Not only the restoration of this temple, but the future millennial temple. But the first six verses really sums it up. Look at verse 1 through 6. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, same time, right? came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of um, Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Okay, here we go. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. What does he say? Repent. You need to repent is what he says. And then God will turn to you. Draw not a God and he will draw not to you. We need a people that are repenting. We need a people that are returning. Back to the Lord. Be ye not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn you now from your evil ways and from the evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, hear this. He's going back to my first point. My words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants to prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. What's he saying? Finally, they looked back at God's commands and followed it, but it was too late, therefore we were judged. First motivation, encouragement is God's word, His commands. Do it because He said it. Do it for His glory, His love. Secondly, God has men, and we see these men, Haggai, Zechariah, preaching the truth, preaching the message. Let me tell you something applicable. God always has a man and a message, okay? 
that man, a God-anointed man to preach the gospel and the word of God. God has those men. They are anointed by God to preach the truth. Amen. We need more of them. We need more God-called men, not self-called men, not self-promoters, but God-promoters. And we, we need more men, God's men, that will preach God's message. God has them. Listen. One of the encouragements we're looking at right now is God always has a man and a message. Go to um, verse 14 again in our text as we'll finish um, in 6, 6.14 this thought and then I'll make some applications. Verse 6.14, go back there. And the elders of the Jews builded and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edu. So it was from the preaching of God's men and their message the people what? Prospered. Okay. We need God's men. That's His preachers. And we need their messages. Amen? It's like people have this idea that it's unnecessary to hear and sit under the preaching of God's Word and God's men presenting it. Where did that come from? Where, when did we become a people that have disregarded God's man and God's message from His Word? It is important. It is God-ordained. It is meant to be. God instituted the preaching of His Word to His local church. It's not something that maybe we want to hear. No, it's needed. It's needed for your encouragement, for your exhortation, for your edification, for challenging you, for being taught, and for being told the truth. People say, well, I can just live my life and I don't need church. I have this and I have that. I don't need... No, you need it. You need to hear preaching. You need to hear the truth. You need to hear God's Word from God's man. You need it. When you go without it, you slide. You need to listen to God's man and God's messages. We need to respond to God's men and their messages. If they're from the word of God. That's what these people of Israel did. They heard Haggai. They heard Zechariah. They listened and they responded. We need to respect God's men and God's messages. That is, we take it seriously. We know the weight and the importance. Listen, it's not just some, just okay, at 1040 or 11 o'clock we come in, we say, no, this is an important God-ordained time. And we respect it. We come in ready to hear God's message. God still gets His messages across through the preaching of His Word. This very day. Amen. The last encouragement we'll see is because of God's help, but it's got to be God's commands first. Then we hear the message from God's men and God's message. Now we're going to look at the encouragement because of God's help, and that is the majority of our text. We'll just read it, uh, not dive in deep, but understand what's going on in God's help. Encouragement because of God's help. If you will, go to uh, verse 3 of chapter 5, and let's just read. I'll talk you through it. what's going on here, and it'll be very clear. So at the same time, okay, they had responded to God's men and God's message. They had begun to rebuild the temple again. They responded to God's commandment. Now discouragement comes again. Okay, But this time, they don't let it get them down. They allow God to help and they keep going on. We'll see it. At the same time came to them Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, 
and uh, Shethar Bazani and their companions and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Then said we unto them after this manner, What are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Discouragement's coming in, but this time's different. What did the people do? We're not stopping. We're not ceasing. Because the, the, when it says the eye of their God, that's the providential hand of God. God's helping them now. They responded. God is helping them. He's going to get them through it. The copy of the letter that Tatnai governor on this side of the river and Shetbar Zunai and his companions, the Afarsakites, which were on this side of the river, sent unto Darius the king. They sent a letter unto him wherein was written thus. So they write a letter to King Darius. The, and unto Darius the king, all peace. Be it known unto the king that we went into the providence of Judea to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones and timbers laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. It's going well. Then ask we those elders and said unto them thus, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. And thus they returned us, answering, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. We're serving God and respond to his commandments. But after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven under wrath, they sinned. He gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, right, Persia took over Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build the house of God. Go back, build the house. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple, that was in Jerusalem, and brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon. And they were delivered unto one, whose name was Sheshbavar, whom he had made governor. And he said unto them, Take these vessels, go, carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be built in his place. Then came the same Sheshbavar and laid the foundations of the house of God which is in Jerusalem. Cyrus says, Go back home. He says, Take all the temple vessels take it home, so they do return, they take the vessels, and now they've built the foundation. God helped them because they were responding to God. And since that time, even until now, hath it been in building, and yet it is not finished. They ceased for 15 years. Now therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus, the king, to build this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. So then he says, here's what you, and you need to do. Go back in the history books and look if, in fact, King Cyrus said, go back and rebuild the temple, Darius. So then Darius the king, in chapter 6, made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls where the treasure was laid up in Babylon. And there was found at... Achimutha, in the place that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. Here's what it said. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem, let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits, and the breadth thereof three score cubits with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, and let the expense be given out of the king's house, and also let the golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon, be restored, and brought again to the temple, which is at Jerusalem, every one to his place, and place them in the house of God. So he says, I found it, Cyrus did order it, so now therefore... Tatnai, that's the guy that 
wanted them to stop the work. Governor beyond the river, Chet Barzunai, and your companions, the Aphrosactites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. The next seven verses, and we'll be done reading. Here's what Darius is saying. I found the letter. Now you leave them alone. God is helping them because they responded. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree that you shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered. God's helping them. Not only do you leave them alone, but you provide the finances necessary for them to build the house and don't hinder them. Let's get it done. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven. Not only they're providing the expenses, but they said, let them offer to their God. Give them lambs and bulls. Wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day with that fail. God is providing everything they need. God is helping them. That they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, whosoever shall break this word, he says, that shall hinder them, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon. And let his house be made a dunghill for this. Anybody opposes them, they're going to die. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and destroy this house of God which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. Then Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, Shet Arbazani and their companions, and according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. God helped them and they rebuilt it the temple. What do I see here? When you are responsive to God's commandments, to God's message, then you are in turn encouraged by God's help. And He will provide what you need. God will truly help those who help themselves who are taking the right steps in the right direction. Now, obviously not salvation. You can't help yourself in salvation. It's only by the Lord Jesus Christ. But when it comes to service, it emphasizes the importance of self-initiative when serving the Lord. You must take the initiative and respond to God. You must make that first move. Then God is going to help. God's going to provide what's needed and what is necessary for your service. Many wait around all their life for God to move, for God to move them, for God to do this, for God to give me something, God. You go while God is waiting for them to respond to His already proclaimed commandments and message through His many. So they've already said it. You've already heard it preached. You respond. Get up, take the initiative to serve the Lord and return to worship. God provide and will provide everything that we need. Most of all, He has given us the Holy Spirit. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. A helper. God seeks to help His people in every way is they serve and worship, but His people must be willing to help themselves. Second Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work, what? Neither should he eat. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, James says in chapter 4, verse 8. This morning, as we have looked at return to worship encouragement, I want you to first and foremost be encouraged to return to worship because of God's command 
God's word because of God's love, mercy, and his grace. That's got to be your encouragement. Secondly, I want to encourage you to respond to God's men and God's messages through his word. Thirdly, be encouraged to keep on keeping on because of God's help. Be encouraged to serve and worship because of God's love through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I really think that the gospel is the pinnacle of our encouragement. I really think it is. That the apex of why we're encouraged to return to worship is because we were once sinners, but God commended His love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because He loved us and sent His Son to die on the cross to take our sin. shed his blood, was buried, and three days later conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he offers us salvation through the guiding, directing, convicting of the Holy Spirit of God by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the greatest encouragement of all. And I want to encourage you that if you have never been saved, you have never repented of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you do so this very day. And let that be your encouragement going forward. And those people that are saved, let God's mercy, love, and grace be your encouragement to return to worship and to serve Him. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message, for your word, for your commands, God, for your help. Be with Bethel as we go through this stage of returning to worship. May we be your servant. Servants, may we be motivated by your word, by your by love, by your grace, and by your mercy. And may we respond to the preaching of your word. If anybody is under this preaching, Lord, that is being led to salvation, God, may they humble themselves before God and allow God to lift them up. All these things I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll end our life. Amen.